Now, I consider myself a pretty positive person, okay? I, I like to uh, think thoughts that would be uplifting. I like to uh, just go about life thinking of the future, you know, being the best yet. But when I uh, look at the uh, nation that we're in and the people around me, I have a lot of trouble in my spirit. And I'm very, very concerned. Uh, I love people, but I see a great emptiness in people in America. And I see a great struggle that's going on in their spirit. And so I look at the Word of God and I realize that the Bible teaches some things about what the last days will be like. And so please understand you know, what the, the scriptures teach on this. For example, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. And so when I look at that, I don't just say to myself, oh, there's, those are the bad people. I'm on the good people's side. So I look at myself and I realize that I have a fallen, sinful nature, just like everybody else in the world. And that I'm capable of any of these on this list. And so when the Bible says people will be ungrateful, unholy in the last days, I say to myself, I don't say, oh, that could never happen to me. I say, it must not happen. But the characteristics of society before Jesus comes is going to be pretty dire. And it's going to be difficult. And we have to make ourselves aware of that. Especially when it comes to things of the state and the church. You have noticed, haven't you, that the, the state and the government is becoming more and more uh, difficult toward churches here in America. And so understanding that it may come to the place in the future where there are things outlawed as far as Christianity is concerned that are allowed today. Now I'm not uh, an alarmist. As I said, I'm a very positive person, but I just recognize the trends. And without a major revival in America, the, the the people of Jesus Christ, Christianity, is being squeezed more and more and more. So keep that in mind. But even more than that is the moral uh, spirit inside of people. That in the last days, we're going to see a lot more immorality than has been. So keeping aware that I have to be careful, you have to be careful. I don't want to develop a spirit of the world that's manifested in, in gratitude. Yesterday, uh, Terry and I and uh, Nicole and Tyrus were here, and uh, Edwin and Liz, uh, we had an opportunity to just kind of be out and about in the city. And we went to the Franklin Institute and had a chance to go to the planetarium and uh, just kind of sat back and watched the presentation of we went and saw the one of asteroids, which is very interesting. You know, these big rocks floating in space uh, that could possibly come hurtling to Earth. Uh, but thank God, you know, we're, we didn't spare that. But as I looked and as I considered the greatness of God, I realized that Romans chapter 1 teaches us that throughout the world, God has taken nature and has said, this is something that I have given to you to point to me. And so the Bible says that where people are in humanity are without excuse. That if we want to know the God who's behind this amazing nature, that we can get to know him. We just simply have to seek him. And he told us in the book of Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, 
although they knew God, were able to know God at least about his characteristics through nature and through the universe, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So I noticed here that the Bible says that even though they can know about God and know God, they don't give thanks to him. And I'm wondering, you know, over the Thanksgiving weekend uh, in America where we have such a blessing, how many people <coughs> gave thanks to God? How many people? Or do we, who do we thank? If we don't thank God, who do we thank? I asked an atheist that one time, and he had no answer for me. I said, God has you know, blessed you. you have, who do you give thanks to? He says, well, you know, I work hard. I just, it's basically all about himself. But our God, we want to glorify him and give thanks to him, <clears throat> give him the worship that he deserves. Ingratitude is sort of like a snake bite. Every one of us has it. We've all been snake bit, but there is an antidote. So what's the antidote to ingratitude? It's knowing God through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to be my sacrifice. He came to take my place. He came to pay the penalty for my sins so that I can repent. I can turn from my own wickedness and turn to God and have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And I'm able to express my gratitude and thanks to him. Aren't you glad for Jesus? Yeah. He's awesome. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. Yeah. And as I focus on Jesus, the scripture that comes to mind is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, which says this about thankfulness. By him, therefore... Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of lips giving thanks to his name. <clears throat> so if I am in relationship with God, rather than ignoring God and becoming darkened in my mind and understanding, if I step into the light and say, you know, Jesus, I, I'm going to trust you, then I can go ahead and, and develop inside of me a spirit of gratitude, a spirit of thankfulness that will caused me to overflow in praises to God. I love praising God. How about you? Amen. Praising God, Amen. it not only glorifies God, but it's amazingly healthy for us to do. You want to be healthy spiritually, right? I want to be healthy. Then I'm not... I can't allow myself to obsess in life over things that don't go my way. Because I will be miserable. There's a lot of things that don't go my way. But if I say to God, God, I'm going to trust you in my life. And I'm going to choose to praise you and to thank you no matter what happens. Then I'm on my way to spiritual health and strength. And so my mind goes back in the Bible to Psalm 103. Okay, we've been snake bit, but I want to read you the antidote. Okay, here's the antidote that can save us from our sickness and our spiritual death. It's Psalm 103. This is my favorite psalm. I hope you like it too. It is just amazing. All right? I'd like to ask you, and I know, I know we read this last week, and I thought, you know, when I'm getting this sermon together, I'm thinking to myself, Lord, we read the scripture last week. Do we want to speak on this again? Is this something that you want me to speak on today? And absolutely. I just felt that sense of strength to do that. I'd like to ask you to read the first four verses with me. Then once I switch the slide, I'll go ahead and read the rest. But I want you to read this. Okay? Y'all ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Praise. praise the Lord, O oh my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, 
who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Thank you for reading that with me. And it gets better. Let's keep reading. Okay, I'll read. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. I'd like to have you read the last three verses with me. All right, let's begin. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to end this message with uh, Terry and the kids coming back in, and we're going to stand and we're going to sing praises to God. Maybe we'll sing the same song that we sang earlier about uh, praise the Lord. Okay. Amen. He is so good to us. So here's what I want to talk to you about today, is give God the praise that he deserves. Give God the praise that he deserves. And so my question that I've asked myself as I've prepared this message is, why is gratitude so good? Why is God you know, uh, appreciated, but why is it so good for us? to be grateful, and to give God praise? That's the question. Gratitude is good for us because it forces us to remember. Now, sometimes, I'm ashamed to say this, but sometimes when I sit down for a meal, and I'm all by myself, sometimes it's so easy just to think in my mind, okay, God, I thank you for this food and then just jump right in. It's easy to do that. But when I stop, and when I pause, and when I just say, God, I wouldn't even have this food if it were not for you and for your blessings. Thank you for even health to be able to eat and be able to have strength from this food. You see, Gratitude forces us to remember. It forces us to think. I'm not the source of everything in my life that I need. God is the source of my life. And so we, it's good for us to pause, isn't it? It's good for us to just recognize it in gratitude. That's why the psalmist said this. He said, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. So he's, he's stirring himself up. Because our carnal nature, we don't even like to think about God. We just think you know, of ourselves all the time. But he's praising God. He's stirring up his soul, saying, soul, you're going to praise the Lord. And the Bible says, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. 
God has given you, he's given me so much. There are benefits from his grace. And so what do we do with that? We can't ever repay God back, but we can say, God, I praise you. God, I thank you. You're a good God. And God accepts that. Amazingly. He accepts that from us. Last week, uh, Pastor John preached the message. And in the message, he spoke about we serve the God who forgives us. We serve the God who delivers us. We serve the God who transforms us. And the most important thing that we have to be thankful for in life, even if everything else were taken away, is that He is God. A few years ago, I discovered surprisingly, that I had skin cancer. And I thought, skin cancer, that can't be that bad. It's just, you know, stuff on, this, on your skin. It just can go away, right? Well, melanoma is a lot more than just stuff on your skin. It manifests itself in the, in the skin. But what's so difficult about this uh, skin cancer is that once it gets inside of you, your body doesn't recognize it as an enemy. And so your body never attacks it. it melanoma just grows. And so they had to you know, do a surgery. And I believe in God's healing. I really do. I've seen people healed and so on. But sometimes we go through things instead of always being delivered out. I guess I had to go through. So I had my thumb and some of my uh, underarm uh, taken out, which were lymph nodes. Okay. And then about four weeks, no, it was a few months ago, actually, I discovered a large lump on my arm. And so I went in, and uh, just this past Monday, uh, I was in the hospital, and they were sticking needles in this lump in my arm and diagnosing it. Uh, but thank God, uh, I haven't gotten the results yet, but if they were, if it were cancerous, I would have gotten the results. But I share that with you because my body belongs to God, right? Your body belongs to God. And whatever we go through in this life, it's going to be okay. God's with us. He, he, he helps us. And he's the one. If I have the strength to be able to stand up, he's the one who gives me that strength. And if we're free from diseases, he gives us that power and that ability. So we're going to use every day that he gives us to glorify him. Amen? Amen. So he's a good God. And we can trust him. So forget not all of his benefits. Every day with Jesus is a good day. Praise the Lord. Give God the glory that he deserves. Why is gratitude so good for us? Gratitude reminds us what truly satisfies. Can you be happy in life with the small things that go right? Can you be happy with that? Some people cannot be happy in life until they think they have a lot of money. I, you know, they say, I can only be happy if I have this certain amount of money. And when they get there, that doesn't satisfy. So they need more money. Can we be happy in life with friendships? Can we be happy in life that God provides us with a warm room to stay in, with clothes to wear? Can we be happy that we can, we're able to walk? If we have that attitude that God can satisfy us with himself and with the, the, the basic blessings of life, that you're going to be a happy person. You're going to be a person who's content. Godliness with contentment, the Bible says, is a great gain. So be content. Be satisfied. It is amazing that in the world without God, people can have all the world has to offer still not have peace of mind and still not have satisfaction. The Bible says in verse 5 in Psalm 103, God, the Lord, he's the one who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So here's the great challenge. Every one of us has this right here, right? We all have desires. The problem is, is that our sinful nature 
convinces our mind that the only way to really be satisfied is to partake of sinful desires, is to give in to those, because that will make you happy. That's what the sinful nature tells us, but it's never true. And so when we are filled with gratitude and praise to God, we realize that our satisfaction comes from Him, that He truly satisfies us, and we don't need all the things that the world says we need. We don't need to get high. We don't need to drink. Amen. We don't need to, you know, uh, explore with all kinds of relationships with people. We can find satisfaction in God. The happiest people in the, on the planet are the people who walk with Jesus. Because Jesus satisfies. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. amen. So let's be thankful. Let's be thankful that God has given us everything we need. We don't have to just sit back and say, oh man, you know, people in the world can do this and they can do that. I can't because I'm a Christian. It's not that way at all. We get to serve God. We get to have the presence of God. That's the very best in life. He's our father. And he's our inheritance. And we're his children. And he calls us his portion. Can't beat that. The Bible says, taste and see. God satisfies us, but we have to partake. We can't just you know, sit back. We have to seek him. And when it comes time to you know, praising God in our life, we have to praise him. We don't want to hold our praises back. We say, God, I'm going to praise you in life, no matter what. Taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. He's good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Amen. So, give God what? The praise he deserves. Give him the praise that he deserves. Gratitude is good for us. Here's something else gratitude does for us. All right? Gratitude humbles us. Gratitude humbles us. Now, I used to think, as a young Christian, that being humble meant, you know, I would walk around with my head down and telling myself how bad I was. I used to think that that was humility. Oh, you know, I can't, I can't do that. I'm just such an awful person. Look at the thought I had 20 minutes ago. What an awful thought. Well, you know, I can't serve God. You know, I'm just so, so bad. But, yeah, I'm being humble, Lord. No. That's not being humble. Being humble is recognizing you know, who God is and who we are in relationship to God. Mm -hmm. God has given you many strengths and many talents. We don't have to apologize for that, and we don't have to be like, oh, I can't do anything in life. We simply recognize the talents and the strengths come from Him. And humility is just being in proper relationship and alignment with it's saying, God, I recognize that you're the creator, that you're, you're everything, and I recognize that you've made me for your glory. So humility is basically the recognition of God and being thankful to him for what he's done. You know, when I humble myself before God and walk in humility, I recognize down deep inside how much I really need God. Because I can go ahead and slip into arrogance and pride just like anyone else. I say, well, I really don't need God. You know, I have this and I have that. Usually it's, it's a money thing in this world. You know, people, when they have a lot of money, don't think that they need God. But I think of this myself. You know, I have all that I need at this very moment to live. But I have no guarantee that tomorrow I'm going to have what I have today. Do you understand what I'm saying? And tomorrow I might be in eternity out of this body. And so where would I be? What would I be doing? I'm dependent upon God. Not to give me life in this flesh forever because I don't last forever. You're in a body too, right? You're not Superman, are you? Right? So your body also is getting older. And so our trust 
And our humility is that we serve a God that even though we're created and our bodies will fail, we serve a God who has promised us eternal life. Mm -hmm. And it's not just some pie in the sky or some Santa Claus story. He's promised us eternal life and he proved it by sending Jesus and resurrecting him from the dead. Our hope is real. Our life is for real because of Jesus. So walk humbly before God. Don't think yourself God, but walk humbly with God. And when you're a thankful person, when you thank other people, what you're doing is you're crucifying your pride, and you're saying, I need something that you have, and I appreciate that you share that with me. So thankfulness, not only toward God, but toward each other, brings us closer together. Because when you do something that's kind to me, even very simple, I drop something and you pick it up for me, I say thank you because I appreciate you and I appreciate you know that we can be part of the same family of God and you've done something to help me and I want to do something to help you. So again, humility is gratitude not only to God but to one another. The Bible says the Lord is compassionate slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. And verse 12 goes on to say, and the Lord is compassionate because he recognizes that we are dust. Now, when I get too high and mighty in my thoughts, Verse 12 of Psalm 103 comes along. God knows that we are dust. Okay? I've done a lot of funerals, officiated a lot of funerals in my life, over 100, and I recognize that we, we go to the dust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's okay, though. It's okay. I'm not trying to do, do, do press you. I'm not trying to depress you. But I'm trying to say, let's be thankful for what God has given to us. And let's express that in praise. So this dust is going to praise God. Till I can't talk anymore, I'm going to praise God. And then I'll be able to be in heaven praising God. So give God, what are we talking about? Give God the praise he deserves. Okay? And we're asking ourselves the question, why is gratitude good for us? What is good about gratitude? Number four. Gratitude develops a grace outlook. Now here's how it goes. I've been a believer in Jesus uh, since I was 17 years old. And I've read many times in the Bible where people, especially religious people, can have a tendency to trust in their works. The Bible calls it a works righteousness. It goes like this. Well, I'm right with God because of all the good things that I've done. I don't steal from people. I treat people right. I give money to church. We can go ahead and have an attitude that we're right with God because of all the good things that we've done. Okay? Now, we have to be really careful. God wants us to do good things, obviously, but we are not to trust in those things that somehow that's a repayment to God. Okay? We don't buy God off. God doesn't owe us anything. If I were to take Everything that I have, from the clothes and furniture, given away to the homeless people in Philadelphia, I still could not come before God and say, God, look at all the good that I've done. Now you owe me. See, God doesn't owe us anything. So our righteousness is based upon faith. It's based upon trusting God. Let me say it another way. One of the dangers that we as Christians have who have been walking with God for a while is the danger of entitlement. 
We get an entitlement mentality. I've heard it from Christians that have walked with God for a long time. Here's how it goes. I heard someone say, well, my mother is a godly person, and I don't understand why she's sick like this. I don't understand because you know, she served God all of her life, and she, you know, she shouldn't be in that situation. Ah, a little bit of entitlement mentality. You understand? Or, here's one, why do bad things happen to good people? That's another one. I've heard Christians say that too, as if they're saying, well, I'm a good person. You know, why, why would bad things happen to me, God? You know, you must not be running the universe, right? Because you would recognize that I'm such a good person that you need to be blessing me, not allowing me to have difficulties. Okay? We have to be very careful about the spirit of entitlement. Because God is God, and he's perfect, and compared to him, none of us is good. Not one is good. We are all in need of his forgiveness and of his grace. And so if God does good things in our lives, we need to thank him, and we need to praise him. We don't want to have the attitude, well, yeah, you know, I kind of deserve that. If God does something good, we don't want to sit back and say, well, you know, yeah, I'm such a good Christian, you know, I'm such a good person. Of course he needs to bless me. No. It's the spirit of gratitude that pushes out the spirit of entitlement. You guys are following me, right? Amen. Because that's a trap. The enemy tries to put before us if we've walked with God for a long time. That somehow God owes us. No. God is a God of grace. And everything we have in our life is because of grace. Amen. Thank you for that amen. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. This was when the Apostle Paul okay, was going through something. Now, the Apostle Paul... If there's anybody that served God wholeheartedly and sacrificed, it was Paul. And Paul had something that came into his life, and he couldn't pray it away. It was like, wow, this is a struggle that I'm having. And Paul said he prayed three times for it to go away, and it still didn't go away. And so this is the conclusion that Paul came to, that God spoke to him and said this. But he said to me, this is Paul saying that about the Lord. He said to me, my grace is is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. I believe in deliverance. I believe in answers to prayer. And I know our God is an awesome God. There are times that we go through things that we don't understand why we're not completely delivered of them right away. We will go through those times. You might have a difficulty at work or a difficulty in your family. You say, God, I've been praying about this for a long time. I just don't know why they won't change. I don't know why this circumstance doesn't change. But allow God to speak to you words of grace. Amen. That his grace is sufficient for you. God will bring you through it. He brings us to things to bring us through things. Amen. That's our God. Now, last thing I want to share with you is this thought. Okay. So we have this awesome God. He's created everything. <coughs> and we ask ourselves, what can I give to God? I mean, when I look up into the universe and I, I see the stars and I, I realize that there's more stars out there than there are grains of sand on the earth, I think to myself, what could God possibly receive from me? But there's something I can give God that he doesn't have. Do you realize that? There's something you can give God that he doesn't have? See, he created you with the ability to give him thanks or to not give him thanks. 
to give him your heart or to not give him your heart, to give him praise or to withhold praise. And the way that God made you is that God doesn't force himself to you where he extracts that as he would from a robot. God hasn't made you that way. And so you can give God something that he doesn't have, and that is your life and heart. And that is your thankfulness. And that is your gratitude. He won't force you to give that to him, but you can give it as your present to God. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know. You know I don't know what you're thinking or, or exactly how you live. But as for me, I'm going to praise the Lord. Amen. How about you? Amen. I'm going to praise the Lord with my life. Because it is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord. Amen.